Pastor Zillinger's Daily Devotions. The Lessons for the Twelfth Sunday of Pentecost. Psalm 34, 5. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Question for you is that when you go to church and you hear God's word and you have his sacraments forgiven of your sins, you hear about Jesus Christ, um, it changes and affects you. Do other people see that change on you, especially by looking at your face? I think sometimes Lutherans maybe are a little dour. Um, maybe when we're coming back from communion, I see that often. Now, I understand they might be meditating or doing something, but this should be a radiant thing. I was just forgiven. I've got strength for uh, all my day. This is what Jesus Christ has given me. It's a great gift. We should be happy about it. Our faces should be changed. Same as going to worship on Sundays. It should be a joyful thing. And I think that's something to pass on to our kids because oftentimes we always treat it as a duty, not as a fun thing. Now, granted, sometimes practices in sports are not fun, but they're good because after you get done, you're like, man, that was really good, that kind of thing. So just to let you know, it's not all about what we want, sometimes what we need, and that changes our appearance even. First Kings 19.4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. This is Elijah, and after he had the big showdown at Mount Carmel, and uh, the king and the queen of the land, these are Israel, this is supposed to be God's children, are like, you're going to die. So he runs away, and he's like, I'm no better than my fathers. Elijah admits that he is part of his community, and even though he's a prophet, even though you would say he's a really good guy, he admits, you know, I'm part of the sinful community too, I'm no better than any of these people for this. And I'm going to die by the enemies of this Lord. It'd be better for you to take my life. And God then says, after this, he says, I want to show you the people who will stand with you. And so I always ask people, like, when you feel this in despair, when you feel like everything's falling apart, look around at the people who stand with you. Those Christians, those people in your immediate family, those people in your church family, because they will stand with you. They will say, hey, we love God. We love his word. We love Christ our Lord. We're with you, even in the pits of despair, even in the greatest joy. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, and practice every kind of impurity. Christians don't act like your Gentile neighbors. Now, if they are Christians, great. You might want to ask the question of how mature they are. That's the next one. Because you might have some Christian neighbors and they're baby Christians. Like, that's good. You don't um, follow baby Christian practices. You are mature. You lead. You serve baby Christians. That's the way you do it. But there's the other one of there's Gentiles out there that do not believe in Christ, that do not believe his word. And we always try to copy them. We always try to say, oh, that's the fad. We should do what they do. Or always try to listen to them that, oh, they must be right. God must be wrong. Like, no, just throw that stuff all away. Go back to focusing on God and his word and then moving out uh, in maturity and serving one another and even serving the world, those who are darkened, that they might hear the good news of Christ. John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is Jesus's um, uh, preemptive, if you would, or first lessons um, talking about himself it's the bread of life and with Moses and everything, um, but then also kind of looking forward to what we have as clear doctrine in the other Gospels about communion. And then Paul talks even more about communion. So we're kind of have adding up on this that Jesus says, whoever eats of my flesh um, has real life. Um, he's the bread of life for things. And people didn't like this. Uh, when you talk about sacramental language, even at Jesus' time, even when the Son of God was saying things to people, there were people that said, you are crazy, you're nuts, I'm leaving. And that's what we have this day, too. When we say, hey, Jesus said these things. He's the real food for us. He's real body and blood. This is where he's at. This is the sacrament. There are many people, including some immature Christians, that will say, I don't like what you say. I would rather have the fun, or I'd rather have the things that I understand and want. And we go, no, we're going to take what Jesus has. He is the words of eternal life, as Peter says a little later on in this text, is that Jesus is where it's at. His words, his sacrament, we're going to cling to that, because if you have forgiveness of sins, you have life and salvation and everything else. The Lord bless your day as well as your week.